G'day, I'm Dale Blackwood. Welcome to another episode of Completely Cooked Games. In this episode of Completely Cooked Games, we're going to cook up an old school portable Zelda, which means we're going to need some Zelda. Actually, you know what? We're going to need a lot of Zelda. In fact, I'm just going to put all these guys in, even the spicy stuff. Speaking of spice, I'm going to add some chili. I don't know why, I just think it'll add a lot of chili. And then lastly, uh, it's going to be DS inspired, so I'm going to put a 3DS in there. Uh, we'll be making this with Blender and Inkscape and uh, C++. So the preparation for this is going to be around 18 months. Wait, what? What have I done? I set out to write some graphics demos and I ended up making a game with its own game engine in C++. Now that's a net win for the game maker and the technologist in me, but it doesn't really tick any boxes when it comes to making a YouTube video. So in this video, I figured it could be interesting to talk through what it takes to make your own game using your own game engine, the steps I took, and what I figured out that you should avoid should you want to take the journey too. Speaking of which, let's start with one big thing to avoid. Don't make your own game engine. Writing your own game engine is a surefire way to trade making your own game for making your own engine. If you want to make a game on your own, use Godot. It has everything you need and is worth figuring out. I think it's important to acknowledge that game engine development is its own exercise and it's an incredibly stupid undertaking for anybody hoping to make a little indie game. Even knowing where to start can be a bit difficult. So I'm going to show you my process and my decision making. Bear in mind, this is my first time creating a game engine from scratch. And there are any number of ways you can tackle making a game engine. There's a ton of good information and quality tutorial material freely available all over YouTube. There's differing opinions and techniques, and it's worthwhile considering those when you bear in mind that this is objectively the best way to do it. So before we get started with the how, let's figure out the why. Why on earth would I make a game engine? How was I able to actually finish a game using it? What steps did I take? Who killed JFK? And is game engine development for you? To figure all that out, we need to head back to the days of the Nintendo DS. Mizen Plus! The Legend of Zelda Phantom Hourglass was released for the Nintendo DS portable system in the spring of 2007 as far as my hemisphere is concerned. Taking place immediately after the events of The Wind Waker, this cute, portable adventure continued to follow the whimsical journey of the young Link as he merrily went about sailing over the flooded grave of the Kingdom of Hyrule. The game itself is fun. Well, it's alright. It isn't particularly noteworthy as far as Legend of Zelda games go, but while I was replaying it, I couldn't help but shake a niggling feeling. I reckon I could make this. I mean, I'm not a Nintendo DS game, but there's a chance I could make one, right? Well, I did already, but just pretend with me for a bit. Why on earth did I believe that I could make something that Nintendo made on my own technology on my own? First, let's bring up the Zelda game and enhance. And enhance. Enhance. Now freeze. Right there. That's him. That's the guy. If you look closely, there are a few little conveniences baked into the Phantom Hourglass that made making it more manageable for the portable team. Conveniences that I can use myself. Did you notice the grid? How about now? How about now? How about now? Yeah, you get it, you noticed it. All the maps in Phantom Hourglass conform to a grid just like this. The terrain's made up of blocks in a manner not too dissimilar from the way I built levels for the last video I did, Amazing Package Delivery. It's kind of similar to the way that you'd build structures in Minecraft. There are a couple of reasons why this could be. Grids are simple from a data perspective, they're just a big long list of tiles split over two coordinates, which makes for a convenient and lightweight way to store level information. This is pretty useful on a Nintendo DS, and it is for other old game systems too, as the storage is kind of at a premium. Most DS games are under 64 megabytes in file size. Don't even worry Nintendo, I know the file sizes because I dumped the games myself. But much more importantly than that, grids are a super convenient way to quickly draw top-down maps. The map can be represented in 2D space, which makes authoring levels for it super convenient. It also means we don't need to make any tooling. I can just use a 2D map editor like Tiled. 
Tile's a fantastic tool for creating maps for 2D games, and all we really need to do is add one more D, and we've got a 3D game. For now, consider my main delusion behind needing my own game engine to be that I'm targeting a Nintendo DS, or at least its rough technology level, and I'm planning on using Tile to author my content. First up, I've got to do the graphics renderer, and to do that, I need to teach my graphics card to draw triangles. All 3D models in all games are made up of triangles. In some, it's more obvious than in others, but they all do it, no matter how complex. So I followed the OpenGL tutorial on how to draw a triangle. And here's the triangle. This is pretty big and a major win. All I need is tens of thousands more triangles than this and I'm done. Continuing on, what has six sides and is more three-dimensional than a triangle? Why, it's our old friend Cube from Minecraft. This one's also on OpenGL Tutorial. So Cube's great and all, but it's time to get his more attractive mate, Textured Cube, going. Actually, I think this is the one from Minecraft, but it looks more like a die. You guessed it, another tutorial. Next up, we're going to need to render Susan's, and by that I mean the Blender Default Monkey. So I've exported that as an OBJ, which is a static model format, and I'm rendering that in Engine. And I've written a custom parser that knows how to read OBJ formats. Just kidding, this is also a tutorial. So now that I've done three or four basic OpenGL tutorials, I am the king god of video game graphics, and I could take either John Carmack or Michael A. Brash in a straight up fist fight. So with that in mind, I think it's time to try the 2D, 3D tile map layout thing that I'd intended to make. So this is Tile, the 2D map editor. And over here on the right, you can see the tiles that represent the various terrain shapes and heights that I've got. And I'm just going to paint those in, and presto, the thing did the thing. I got the thing to do the thing where it uses a 2D map and height instructions to build a level out of cubes. It's just like Minecraft. Then I'll clean up a couple of the edge cases to get the map modeling and rendering itself properly before importing a modeled, rigged and animated model from an older project just to see how that is. As you can see, at this stage, I have done some height-based collision detection with the map and also some animation code on the player. Next, I'm going to create a second map and make it so that you can walk between them. I'll then make sure that you can push crates, and now we're starting to look like a little bit of a game. So the tutorial took a couple of days and the rest of the engine tech about a month. So now that we've gone through the excruciating tech discovery, maybe we should try figuring out why. So, if I'm going to make an adventure game in the style of Zelda DS, I'm going to need a fantasy adventure story. One lesser known fantasy adventure series that I'm quite fond of is called The Lord of the Rings, and I figured it could be a worthwhile and novel idea for me to take inspiration from that. And then it dawned on me, haven't I already copied The Lord of the Rings? Back in 2007, my friend Mitch and I released a heavy metal album called Tower of Fire's soundtrack to a Tower of Fire album 4. A horse is a horse, of course, of course, unless that horse is a unicorn. As two gigging extreme metal musicians, we'd had a long-running side project band that parodied power metal called Tower of Fire. Dragons fly around, cast more than you there's a whole story to that, and maybe that's for another time, but the long and short of it is that we released a full-length album in 2007, and on it was a song called The Sword of Unspoken Misk. The Sword of Unspoken Misk is like a bad memory retelling of The Lord of the Rings. Written in a single sitting off the dome, it kind of traces similar events to its inspiration, but in a manner that's rushed and messes up any of the details that it doesn't already gloss over. The titular sword doesn't really have much of a bearing on the adventure itself. In fact, nobody ever describes any properties or characteristics of the Sword of Unspoken Misk that aren't properties or characteristics of a regular sword. But anyway, that self-indulgent detour was made to illustrate a point. The story from that song was written in an afternoon, for a joke, nearly two decades ago, and is no way enough material to spend years developing an adventure game around. So I'm gonna do that. So how am I going to turn this song into a story for the game? Well, the song is already a story, so I'm just going to follow it line by line. So to start with, in the first verse, we've got the player who's going to be a blacksmith. And the blacksmith has his birthright stolen by evil blacklords. So the birthright's gone missing, and the player has to set out to find the leader. 
who gives him the call to action, tells him to set out for what's rightfully his. He then has to gather a merry party, so we'll make that a thing, you've got to go find a party, and then eventually there's a traitor who's in your midst and you have to kill the traitor. I mean, there's not a lot of meat on the bone here, but I figure if we just pin events to these things and have them all happen in order, then the story should happen. The blacksmith had his birthright stolen by evil black lords. And there's three verses in the song total, but I won't show you all of them in case you decide to play it. And you should decide to play it, right? So now that we have a prototype and we've fleshed out the rough idea, it's time to enter production. But before we do that, let's talk about engine technology. Wait, 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 before you go, I promise I won't make it too long or in depth and I'll use exciting car metaphors and leave all that code stuff in the links below for all the nerds who don't like exciting car stuff like we do. When building my engine, my first decision was the programming language. And it wasn't really a choice at all. The programming language is C++. C++ is the programming language most game engines are written in. At least it is for Godot, and Unreal, and Unity, and Source and IdTech, and Gamebryo, Red Engine, Frostbite, Lumberyard, and CryEngine, and Snowdrop, and Anvil, and IW Engine, and each of those is objectively better than my engine. There's a good reason for that. C++ is fast. It's fast because it's statically compiled. That means the compiler generates optimized code for each machine we target, which can result in much better performance. At least in the right hands. It's also what most of the homebrew kits are written in. But C++ is a lot of work. It's a bit old fashioned and there are different ways to compile it for each system. So it can be a bit of a chore when it comes to putting projects together and compiling. To help with that, I use Premake. Premake is a meta build system. It can generate projects for Visual Studio for Windows builds, Xcode for Mac builds, and make files for pretty much everything else and Unix. There are a few tools that can do this too, but Premake is by far the easiest to configure and was an obvious choice for my project. Uh, using car metaphors, Premake is the meta build system that's used to output the project files that create the car. Next up, while I'm building an engine, I don't want to have to create the input code for 100 gamepads and the file system functions for each operating system and all the windowing stuff. So to handle all those bits, I'm using SDL2. SDL2 is a framework that handles input and operating system functions for a whole range of different platforms. It also has features for loading images and audio files, and it'll help make the engine portable while leaving the fun bits up to me. I'm genuinely out of car metaphors at this stage. Lastly, we've got the graphics API, and for this I'm using OpenGL. OpenGL may not be the latest and greatest of the graphics APIs, but it is proven, and it's cross-platform, and there's a ton of decent documentation and tutorials available for it, as we saw in my earlier examples. Again, I owe a lot to OpenGLTutorial.org. I don't think I would have made this project without that resource, and I can't recommend it highly enough. I should probably also talk a bit about how the engine works. Welcome to the Tower Engine, or at least a visual representation of it. So what goes into it? Well, let's start with the systems. To start with, we've got the game. I've put a star next to each of the systems. The game manages pretty much everything, but mostly calls up the scenes. We'll get to these in a moment. We've then got the input manager. So that's what reads input from the gamepads. We've also got the collision manager. I'll get into that in a moment too. And we've got the renderer, which is what finally draws things onto screen. And what we can see here, these functions are the life cycle. We've got our init, which is what we'll call the initialize function and set everything up. And then you've got the loop functions here. So every time it gathers input from the controllers, it then updates the various scenes and entities. It then manages any of the collisions. And lastly, it draws them to screen. And then when it's done with any of these scenes, it'll call destroy in order to get rid of any of the resources that those scenes ate up. So let's take a look at the scene graph. Well, to start with, we can have one scene at a time. So this is that guy, and this could be any map or any world, or it could be the title screen. The scene is just a bucket that contains a bunch of entities. Now, what are these entities? Well, I've highlighted here the player, and we'll get into this in just a moment, but it could be absolutely anything. It could be a tree. It could be a friendly character. It could be an enemy. It could be a cupboard. In my game, it often is. Basically anything at all is an entity. 
each of those entities have many components. So those components could be the 3D model um, with the textures and all that sort of stuff managed within it. It could be a collider, which is instructions on how to handle collisions. It could be a behavior, like if it's an AI, like an enemy, that could be an attacked behavior. Or it could be the renderer, which is actually what will feed this system over here uh, the instructions that it needs to paint to the screen. So that's the player. It's an actor. So the actors are a type of entity that have all of these things built in, a model, a behavior, a collider, and a renderer. I'm using a lot of inheritance in this engine because of the nature of the way that the maps are laid out. Every entity kind of has one definition and they're not so flexible, so it's okay to have concrete types. Uh, it's also worth noting that it's not hierarchical. There's no children of the player. It's all flat structured. Again, this is because it was being fed by a tiled map, which itself has no hierarchy. So essentially, you've got this loop here being called on these things here 60 times a second, and they're kind of managing their own stuff. The, the actual thing is a little bit more complex than this, but not much. Um, I'm going to leave the source code in the description in some form. Maybe don't use this on your own projects. Go use Godot, like I always say. First, I'm gonna need text in the game. So I write some bitmap font support and then use SnowB, the bitmap font generator online and turn it into a title screen. Next, I replace my original placeholder model with a brand new blacksmith model and get it animated and working within the game. But wait, why is that sword floating above his head? Oh, it's because I can't attach it to any bones because Quake 2 models don't have skeletons. So skeletons are used in this manner to drive animation in a 3D model in most modern games. And I skipped that because I thought it would be quicker and easier just to skip it. Obviously that was stupid, so I ripped out the Quake 2 model format and replaced it with IQM, or Interquake Model. It's a model format that the Quake community uses to port between Quake engines. Using its excellent Blender exporters and reference implementation, I was finally able to have skeletal animation in my engine. What, I don't see anything wrong here. I wanted to get interactions and dialogue working, so I set up a command system using objects and properties and tiled and wrote a parser for it. This allowed me to get sequences and cutscenes happening. All of the interactive content in the game would eventually go through this system, so it was a major boon, but working on it was also a bit of a pain in the ass if I'm being honest. Then the rest of the phase was basically about creating maps. And maps, 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 and maps, and maps, and maps, and now we've got a first chapter. Right, so we've got our first playable character and environment, but just like this project, the video has gone on quite a bit longer than I'd intended. So I'm going to cover the rest in a part two video. In the next part, I'll cover the rest of the story, the remaining production, my mod music implementation, graphics improvements, memory leaks and all those kinds of development woes, as well as marketing and release. There's plenty left to talk about, so make sure you subscribe so you know when that video comes out. I've actually already released the game a couple of months ago, and I just now have released my first major update. If you're watching this video at the time it was released, then it's currently being discounted on the Steam Summer Sale, so go get it while it's discounted. It's cheap normally, but at the moment it's insanely cheap. Play it before I release the next video, because that'll contain some spoiler-heavy stuff. Alright, that's it. See you in part two. Go play the game. I love you. Come to game. We might go play the bloody game, the link is in the description. Good on you mate, have a good go at it.